All right, everybody, welcome back to the Mindful Hunter podcast. I'm your host as always, Jay Nichol. Quick note, I want to thank everybody who has supported the new merch. If you haven't already checked it out, just go to mindfulhunter.com slash shop. And I released two different hats, a t-shirt, and two different stickers. Um, and I've hooked up some deals with, with shipping discounts and stuff if you buy more than one item. And you get some free stickers if you buy anything, really. Buy one item, get a little sticker for free. Buy any more than one item, you get both stickers for free. Okay, let's jump right into the episode. So rather unique episode today. Uh, we have a vegetarian on a hunting podcast. And in addition to that, the vegetarian is actually my wife, Noah. So first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to come on the podcast today. You owe me. <laughs> so I thought it would be interesting to have Noah come on the podcast for a couple different reasons. One, how we're able to navigate having meat hunters and vegetarians in the same house. And also, uh, people ask me kind of how I get to hunt so much. Um, we have a kid and that also kind of introduces some complexities into the situation. Okay, so let's let's start with a little bit of background and context us for about us, how we met, how long we've we've been together. Do you want to tell the story of how we met? We met online. We did. Plenty, Plenty of, of fish. fish. Puff. <laughs> was I not the only dude that you actually went out with? Or was I just the first one? One or the other. I think it's the same. Concept. Or you just told me that to stroke my no, ego. No, it's true. Okay. I mean, I don't remember if you were the first that I was in touch with or there were several and you're the only one I met, but I distinctly remember not dating anyone else from that site during that time, but yeah. So to give a sense of time, this it will, it's almost exactly, this is trippy. It's almost exactly 11 years Yeah. in like three or four days. Yeah. I think August 1st, mm -hmm. for some reason I have August 1st down as. Cause it was a long weekend. As our, the first date we went on. So the first date we went on was a dog walk. And what was your reaction? Well, you talked a lot, <laughs> which is too much. Yeah. And that, that remains true to this day. It does. Um, I, did, I don't think I wanted a second date. No, you didn't. And I think your impression was that I had an unruly dog. You did have an unruly dog. He was off leash. Yeah. But he was obedient. So. He looked like a teddy bear, so he got a pass. I was more disturbed with your lack of concern for like any animal management whatsoever. <laughs> like you just let the dog do whatever the dog wanted to do. What? He was a free range dog. Yeah. And Atreyu was like well behaved, on a leash, healed. My dog. Your dog did not do that. He also did not have the capacity to walk up a hill. No, I had to carry him. Yeah. Um, this is very much in line with this conversation though. Why? Animal empathy. Yeah, and, that's and kind of cod funny. Coddling. Yeah. I treated that dog like a baby. You did. Yeah. You did. Um, so that was 11 years ago. Somehow, it was your friend convinced you. Was it Bryce? Yeah. Bryce convinced you to call me for a second date. He said, you can't make up your mind based on one meeting. Yeah. And uh, I listened to him. I also think it's fair to note that you're a journalist by trade. And you basically verbally assaulted me with questions for 90 straight minutes. And I was just like, I just kept answering the questions that you were asking. Um, in hindsight, it probably did feel like I just talked about myself for an hour and a half straight. But I always thought I deserved a little bit of slack because you did. It, I, I was trying to be polite and just answer the questions mm. that, that you were asking me. No one said you couldn't ask a question back, though. This is true. This is true. So we've been together for 11 years. We've been married for, it'll be nine years next month. Um, we've lived a bunch of different places in a bunch of different houses. We've just now moved to, could this be a forever home? 10 years. Yeah. So nice house, East van, fully detached, big deal for us. 
big, big moment. We've only been in here for a week. We have a five and a half year old daughter um, and we have a giant golden doodle named Pickle. That's Is he coddled? That's our family. I don't think so. I think it's interesting that we have Pickle. He's kind of the size of a small bear and you treat him much differently than you do bears. In yeah, the well, wild. one is pets and one is food. Well, I don't treat my food like my pet okay. and I don't treat my pet like food. Some people would say you could eat a dog. And I think that's the whole... Of course they would. And I think that's the thrust of this conversation is what, why do those lines exist where they exist? Because they are artificial. They're real. There's no objective difference other than a domestication argument, but like there's no philosophical or moral difference between a bear and a dog and how either one could or should. Except for the whites of the eyes. Yeah, this is very interesting. So we were reading up and it's not that the whites of the eyes, all animals have whites around the eyes, but dogs have specifically, that trait has been genetically selected for because- They developed, they evolved. Well, that's what, that's what genetic selection is. Okay. The traits that contribute to its success as an animal see greater predilection in future generations. Anyway, they lived with humans and they learned to move the muscles around their eyes in such a way that they show the whites of their eyes so that they elicit reactions like sympathy Pity. That's why they look more, and we, we hear about anthropomorphization all the time. And one of the reasons is eyebrows, for one, and the whites around the eyes. Okay, so that's a very interesting topic for discussion, and we can get into that more later. But first, I think we should back up to the beginning and talk about when you became a vegetarian and why you became a vegetarian. I was five. I liked animals. Very simple. Very childish. Caused my mom a little bit of extra work. I was already a picky eater, so without eating meat, um, you know, meals had so, to be so made So what happened? For me. You just said to her... I have always loved animals, and I... So you just, one day you came to the realization, holy shit, this thing on the plate just mood or whatever, and yeah, that was it. Had no interest in eating it. I was also picky, and it was... To be honest, I'm sure it was also an excuse not to eat a bunch of stuff that my mom put in front of me. Yeah. But there was definitely the the factor of having feelings around the lives of animals and not wanting to consume them. Right. I had a lot more to learn about that, but it was a very basic kid kind of realization. Yeah. And did your father sympathetically become a vegetarian shortly thereafter? Yes. And was there a reason for that? Or he just, it's kind of seems out of character. That's why I'm asking. It's very interesting. I think you should have a talk with him about that. I'm not quite sure. Okay. I think my dad's a picky eater too. Right. And it probably. So it's easier for him to just hop on the train. Yeah. I think yeah. there's a lot of things he doesn't like to eat. Yeah. He still eats fish. Yeah, he does. Um, my dad's a, a plain eater. I'm a plain eater too. So yeah. there's the two, those two things working together, those two factors working, working together, not wanting to eat a huge range of foods and also being sympathetic to, to, to animals. Yeah. So what was your exposure to or opinions of hunting before we met? Zero. So you like didn't even have an opinion on it? Did you know it was like a thing? I probably thought it was bad. Right. I didn't know anyone who did it though. Um, had zero exposure to it. Probably the closest I got to, to knowing anything about it might have been on, on TV. And uh, whenever I saw one of those, it's not a hunting show, but a nature show. If any animal got killed on a show, I would immediately flip the channel. I wasn't interested in, I was interested in shielding myself from it. And you've also primarily lived in cities your whole life. That's true. So you wouldn't have been exposed to it circumstantially. like No. And Vancouver, it's a little bit different now, but Vancouver, 
is not a hunty city by any stretch of the imagination. When I was growing up, Vancouver in the 80s and 90s was, there were a lot of hippies here. Yeah. I mean, now it's a very wealthy city, but when I was growing up, there were a lot of like earthy, granola. Kitsilano used to be absolutely known as hippie central. Right. You know, kumbaya, hemp clothing. Vancouver was very much that. Right. Yeah. And the funny thing is, nowadays, there's actually, it wouldn't surprise people to say that hunting is almost aligned with those. Like there is this like whole foods, organic hunting kind of back to the roots movement. But 10, 20 years ago, that was not there at all. Like not they at would all. have been violently opposed to anything related to hunting. Yeah. It's taken a long time to align the two. Yeah. Or to understand how the two might actually be complimentary. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So we fast forward a little bit. We get in a relationship. I'm not an active hunter when we first meet. I've hunted with my family and I think it was, I was starting to get like to feel the, the urge, like to feel the pull towards going hunting, but I hadn't started actively hunting yet. No. And you didn't even verbalize that no. to me. I had no idea. No, and it wasn't. So how long would we have been together when I first started hunting? Because I, I bought my gun when I was doing the layout on Haida Gwaii. And so it's maybe, it's probably two years we've been together. And that was the first I'd heard of it when you were going over there. Yeah. And you were talking about deer. Yeah. The little deer, right? They have yeah. little deer. There. Yeah, they're Sitka blacktail. Yeah. And they're very small. Did you, I have a question for you. Yeah. Did you maybe keep it kind of under wraps because of my eating habits and my morals? I don't know if I did it consciously. I, I do have a history in our relationship of like not asking permission for things. And then you kind of like find out about them later on. And then we kind of have a conversation about it. So I may have viewed it. It's an interesting, it's an, it's interesting because I never, I can't remember actually coming to you and saying, Hey, I'm thinking about getting back into hunting. I realize that you're a vegetarian. Does this pose any issues for you? And should we have a con? I don't remember that ever occurring. That did not. No. I remember. The, you do what you want. I do. <laughs> um, I remember buying the gun as like the symbol of when I really got back into hunting and having to ship it up to Haida Gwaii on the trailer. And I remember us having some kind of conversation like, oh, you, you what? Plus we, I think we were already like financially joined at that point. Like we did that pretty early on mm -hmm. and it was like, oh, you spent what on what? And you're going to do what? Also the fact that it was a gun, that was, that's also a separate issue. That is, I didn't, that is very interesting. didn't really understand how we were going to keep a gun in our small condo. I mean, we didn't have a kid then, but it was kind of on my mind. Like, is this safe? Is it responsible? Do people keep guns in their houses in Canada? Do we have to keep it somewhere special? Yeah. All that kind of stuff. I also think it's kind of interesting that Haida Gwaii almost helped us, helped us or hurt us. It allowed us to not have to have some conversations because I only, and for context, basically for almost a year and a half, two years, I worked on Haida Gwaii 10 and fours. Mm -hmm. So I'd fly up for 10 days, fly home for four days. So A, the gun lived on Haida Gwaii permanently. And B, I only ever hunted on Haida Gwaii for the first two years. So it was almost like we didn't have to have that conversation because none of it really happened at home. So you never really saw animals, the meat probably, if it came into the house, it was already processed. I don't I remember it at all. And plus you were there for work. So yeah. What you did there while you were working, I didn't really, wasn't really concerned about. I wasn't really on my mind. Yeah. Yeah. So, but then there starts like, obviously at some point it turns from this like passing interest to something far more substantial to me. And I'm trying to think of when we actually started having conversations I can't it. pinpoint a specific time, but 
I think you started to get ideas about different animals. Yeah. I mean, the deer on Haida Gwaii, I feel like you got bored with that or something, or it wasn't. Yeah. You wanted different a different challenge. The elk on Haida Gwaii would have been my first real hunt, right? Because I think, and for more context, essentially all I was doing was hunting after work. Right. Because we were living in a trailer on the north end of the island. Anyways, lots of logging roads. I'd literally get off work and just drive around for a couple hours every day after work. And if I happened to see something, I would shoot it. And if I didn't, and there's incredibly long seasons on Haida Gwaii, so you can hunt kind of all year, except for like a three month period. There's like a nine month doe season and a six month buck season and you can shoot 15 deer. So. But then I started getting the idea that I wanted to do like a more adventure type hunt, like go away for a little bit. And there's a small population of elk on Haida Gwaii. And I went with James Chemko, but we still just like walked in every day, but it was the first time I'd taken like three or four days in a row. And it was like, this is going to be just for hunting. I almost think the other thing is I failed a lot. Mm -hmm. You didn't really have to confront it at first because it's like there was not a lot of animals coming into the into the house. And this is something that frustrates me currently is that everybody's kind of like taken by the hand and taken to a honey hole and like, here, go shoot a white tail. And it just it pisses me off because I think the biggest benefit I got from hunting was how long I failed at it before I got decent. And I think people these days are being robbed of that opportunity for growth because it's just basically handed to them on a silver platter. But that's a, a topic for another podcast. I think really when it hit, so after we got married, we bought the house in Fort Langley. And when we moved to Fort Langley, I stopped going to Haida Gwaii on 10 and fours because we had just had Esme and I'd also just started doing my MBA. Do you know what also came into focus when we bought that house in Langley? What? That you really wanted to embrace like this wilderness outdoors. Right. Thing. The house also had a lot more space. I think I realized that you were going to put things in the house that pertain to this hobby that we couldn't do in our condo. Yeah. Um, I think maybe that's where it, I know that in Langley is where. Well, yeah, because my gun came home. So all of a sudden the gun was in the house. I didn't have any mounts yet because I'd taken a few bucks on Haida Gwaii, but the antlers were so small. You got a bow. That was later though. But you were in Langley. I did get it in Langley. Yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't our first year in Langley. It might've been this, I wonder if the end of the second. But what happened, I think the real catalyst was the black tail that I shot in Chilliwack. Because remember I'd done tons of day hunting, like single day hunts, mm -hmm. but I never come home with anything. Yeah. You went to Squamish. I went to Squamish. I went out to Chilliwack. I did a bunch of stuff. And then I finally one day, and this was right at the beginning of my MBA. It was in like October of, uh, when did we finish the MBA? 14? No, Esme was um, born in 15. So it was before Esme was born. So it was 2015. So six years ago. And I got the Columbia Blacktail in Chilliwack and I brought it home like it wasn't even boned out. It no, was just it was like, in the back of your truck. Yeah, yeah, in a backpack. And I, processed them out in the shed and like cut them up. Didn't even have a vacuum sealer at the time, literally like saran wrap and meat wrap. So I think at that point you, then it was really like, oh, holy shit. There's like dead animals coming into the house and they're being butchered literally in the backyard. So at that point, like, did you ever think you were like going to ask me to stop or is there at some point a, a way to align the fact? Because we had a lot of really deep conversations about it because you were just opposed to it. And I had a very hard time. I remember one of the things I was really frustrated with you on was that somehow in your mind, because I kept saying, I'm tr I, I want as much of the protein as I eat as possible to come from wild game. And you were like, well, if any of it comes from the store, then there's no point 
It should all just come from the store. Right. I said, stop driving through McDonald's. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, well, even if only 20% of it comes from what, at least that's 20% that's not coming from factory farming and, and a bunch. But like that argument didn't really land. But I almost feel like that started to shift over time because I think we did start to have more conversations and you did, you, you, you were able at some point to align the fact like these two realities, reality number one, I'm an animal lover. I'm a vegetarian. I don't want anything to die. And I'm married to this guy who likes to kill shit. You know, I think there are relationships where this would not work. I think there are hardcore vegans that could not tolerate what you're doing. That wouldn't work for them. I think the fact that I'm, I'm very much a vegetarian. I have not eaten meat since I was five years old. Yep. But I eat dairy, I eat eggs. I read about these things. They're not any better than eating meat. Uh, it contributes to this um, industry that I'm against. Um, but I started to understand what you were doing. It was just, it was just talking. Yeah, I was against it very much at the beginning, but I started to understand it better. Um, I don't fully understand why you don't eat 100% of the meat that you get hunting. Because it, it feels. But we still buy beef. Well, I, do, I, it feels, I wish I could. It feels I'd have to, to me, kill more animals. I guess it just feels to me like we have like two freezers full of bear. Right. Yeah. And so that I don't get. Maybe you need variety or it doesn't work for every meal. I don't know. Um, but I, I get it. I, I better get it now. No, that's a fair point. And when I've had a variety of animals in the house, like I can remember when I was still on Haida Gwaii, I had like fish that I'd caught on Haida Gwaii. I had an elk from New Mexico. I had a mule deer and I had some bear. And at that point you can kind of eat exclusively wild game, but literally right now, the only thing we have in the house is ground bear. Mm -hmm. I love bear. I'm not going to eat ground bear every single meal of every single day until the bear is gone. And well, here's an interesting point. Um, I've talked to you about this many times. I think one of the turning points for me was you were cooking. Oh yeah. Ground bear. It wasn't, no, it was elk. The first time this ever happened, it was elk. Okay. It was elk. Yeah. And I was like, that doesn't smell that bad. Yeah. The, the, the smell of ground beef cooking. I don't know if it's what they feed them or it's just the nature of the meat. It's, it's absolutely repulsive to me. Uh, I think even you've said it doesn't smell that no, good. No, it doesn't smell good. I and don't like the smell of most ground beef. The elk and the yeah. bear, when you're doing it up on the stove, doesn't smell unpleasant to me at all. I won't eat it, but it's not foul smelling. You know, it's not an offensive smell. The other thing is that I know Esme's picky and it changes from day to day what she'll eat and what she won't eat. But she really liked bear yeah. meat. Those so remember the sausages I got done with my first? Yeah. I like the butcher just to make like smoky sausages. She loved. That was her favorite meat, hands down. Yeah. So, you know, there was something about that that for me also made things a little easier to swallow. Pardon the pun. I do think her, because you did like the fact that like, because here's another interesting question. You're a vegetarian. Should our child be a vegetarian? We had a bunch of conversations about that right out of the gate. And both of us were on the page that if she chose that as a lifestyle, we would support it 100%. No questions asked. Wouldn't try to persuade her. Yeah. But in an effort for her to have the most well-balanced nutrition possible, even you as a vegetarian was like, as a small child, she should just be eating meat. She meat. doesn't eat enough variety. Yeah. To not eat what we put in front of her right now. Yeah. Um, but she's starting to ask questions. Yeah. And I, I wanted to mention um, when I was a kid, I, I read a lot. I think I was reading very early, maybe earlier than Esme is reading. And I read books like Charlotte's Web right. and all these books with animal characters. I think once she gets into that, she'll have even more questions about it. Yeah. She's already started to ask. Um, she kind of forgets about it when bacon's frying and she smells but you know the, she that does smell love bacon. um but there's been questions here and there about it um yeah she flip-flops with me because i've literally had her say like where'd this come from and then i tell her and then she gets very upset and then she'll ask to come hunting when she finds out that i'm going hunting yeah 
So I think she's just very, very inquisitive still and hasn't really landed one way or another on, on how she feels about it. Yeah. She does, um, she does feel deeply about animals though. Yes. Um, she'll cry over a story that we read her yeah. if an animal gets hurt or if she sees something on YouTube where, you know, so I also think this is part of the problem is, is this like, like fetishization or cartoonification of wildlife that we see because of Disney and all like that is not a portrayal. Like Winnie the Pooh is not what a bear actually acts like. Do you Bambi. know what I mean? And Tigger yeah. is not what a tiger acts like. And it's like, so it is, I do feel a little bit torn there because you're being influenced by things that are completely fabricated. Now, if you were out in the wild and you watched a grizzly, you know, rip apart a black bear and you still felt overly emotional and wanted to protect the grizzly, then at least it's based on some element of reality. But it's like, that is not how those animals exist. It's not how they interact with each other. It's not how they interact with um, each other. Anyways, I just, I find that kind of frustrating. So what would you, how would you feel if Esme does want to ever come hunting? I wouldn't be going with you. Clearly. Um, I don't know. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, around that, there's more to it for me than the animal thing. Like what? There's the safety thing. Right. Will she enjoy it? I'm always questioning whether she really wants to do the things she says she wants to do. Right. And whether she really doesn't want to do the things she says she doesn't want to do. You know, she's, we'll see. I'm not sure yet. I hope she does. I would, just because it's something that I like, like it's a big part of my life. So obviously I would want to, I want to share it with my daughter, mm -hmm. but I'm also, I don't want to force her. That's why I've tried to make camping so fun. Like this is one of the things I picked up from listening to other podcasts and other parents who have children is that you, you have to keep it light and fun from the get go um, so that they start to attach just positive sentiment towards outdoor activities. So I let her bring her iPad and we only go out for one night at a time and we'll get a happy meal on the way back or whatever, just so that she remembers it as a positive, enjoyable experience. And I'm all for that. Yeah, especially because we leave for a couple of days and you get the house to yourself. Yeah, that's nice too. So. Well, that's a good segue into how you leave so often. Yeah, that's funny because that's the next, the next point on the list is how we negotiate time away and finances. So hunting is one thing because you could just do like, if we lived in like Kamloops or Prince George, I could go hunt after work or I could hunt on the weekends or even maybe just take two days off. But I, that's not what I do. Um, I tend to his, historically take four trips a year, anywhere from one to two weeks. Um, and I get questions all the time about A, how do you afford it? And B, how do you negotiate that with your life? I don't want to say get permission because I think that introduces... We've That's something else I think we should get out of the way. We have never asked each other for permission for anything. No. Now, we don't go and do irresponsible things and I will check with you. Do you know what I mean? To see how you feel. I'll be like, this is what I'm thinking I'd like to do. How can we make this happen? But I think that's another reason our relationship has been as successful as it is, is that I never feel like I have to give you permission to do anything. It's more like if it's, I trust that you will make good decisions about how you want to spend our money and what types of things you want to do with your free time. So it's not like we put that um, pressure on each other, but that's, I mean, what, how, cause that's been a, that's been a big that has definitely shifted over time. Because when Esme was a lot younger, there was not nearly as many trips and they had to be shorter. But how is your feelings on that? And what's that been like to watch me go from like, just wanting to hunt to like, hey, I'd like to go to Wyoming for a week, Arizona for a week, and then up to Stewart for two weeks, all in the course of one year or something like that. 
I'll start by saying that the two week trips are hard. Yeah. It's a long time for you to be away. Um, there's, a, there's several factors here. It helps. We have help here in yes. Vancouver. We Two have, sets of grandparents. Yeah. So if I were completely on my own, I don't know how that would shift things. It, it probably would. Um, I'll also say that you ask me in advance. Yeah, like far in advance. Far in advance. And I say yes. And then as the date comes closer, I start reneging on... Yeah. You know, I start thinking, did I, why did I let him do this? Like, why did I agree to this? Yeah. And then when, after you go away, and I forget this every time, after the first couple days, we get, Esme and I get into a groove by ourselves here. She's almost easier with one parent. She doesn't it's the same play when us. you go away. Yeah, she like, she's more difficult when there's two parents home. She doesn't play us against each other, obviously, when yes. we're not both here. Yeah. But we get into a routine. I mean, it's really tiring. By the time you get back, I think the day you, usually the day you get back or the the day after the night you get back, I'm like, I'm off. Yeah. You know, like this, is, you you have to hang out with her for a bit. Um, it, you hate the expression, it is what it is, but that's kind of the process. I say yes, I'm like, shit, why did I say yes? And then it's okay. Yeah. Um, I and I think in the back of my mind, I always know it's going to be okay. Right. Which makes it, easier to say yes. I'd almost say that's one of your characteristics, even with things that you want to do, like business ventures or anything else, you kind of commit to it earlier on when it doesn't scare you. And then as things start to get close, you're like, oh shit, now I'm overwhelmed, but I've already committed to do it. And then you stay the course and you're fine on the other end. Yeah, I agree. With your own ventures. That's my process, right? I think that's something else. We're both, we both own our own businesses. So we both have Flexible schedules, we can change pickups and drop offs and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think a couple points to bring up things that I've learned over the years. I thought living in Fort Langley was going to be better for us because we were going to be able to afford like a nicer lifestyle. We're going to have a bigger home, more space, more money left over to do things with the family. And I was wrong because what was actually important to you was being in the city where you didn't have to drive as much and closer to your support network. Mm -hmm. And I, I learned that, oh, I'm actually going to be going back to the city, but I'm actually going to get more time in the woods because you're going to be more okay with me going away because you're going to have more support systems close by. So that was a big takeaway for me because I thought I was losing something and I was actually gaining something mm -hmm. by moving to the city. And then there was, oh, this is another one that was a really big takeaway for me that I used to be really poor at. When trips start getting close, I start getting obsessively fixated on them. Like, do you remember that one time I had to go to the archery range, like the day before I left and we were at your parent, like it was, it was just a terrible idea. And I've learned that when it gets to, especially within one to two days of me leaving, like that whole week or two leading up, I try and be a little bit more helpful than normal. Maybe do a couple extra pickups and drop offs, take Mimi a couple extra nights just to like pay homage to the fact that I'm about to just take off and you're going to be stuck with her. But those last, that last day or two, I make sure to have everything ready for the hunt before that so that I can be super present for that last day or two, because that's something I used to be terrible at. And then we would, it would be very friction filled the last couple of days. Cause you kind of be pissed at me because I would be on my phone or want to go to the archery range or be packing or looking at gear when what I should have been doing was spending time with Esme or all of us going out for dinner or going over to your parents for a, you know, coffee or whatever. I should have been spending time with the family and I wasn't. And that's something else that I've tried to pay more attention to. Um, the longer I've done this, because I find that makes, then when I'm gone, like I'm leaving on a better note. That's a good tip. This. You also used to come home super depressed. Big time. Whether you got one, an animal or not. Usually You hated being back. Yeah. I think maybe that's gotten a little better. Yeah, and I've realized. And I would dread that. I would yeah. tell people while you were away, yeah. They'd be like, do you hope he gets an animal or not? Because I'm vegetarian. Yeah. 
Um, and I would tell them it's a double-edged sword because if he does, he's a little bit happier yeah. and it's a little bit easier. And if he doesn't, it's terrible. Yeah. Um, maybe you've kept that in mind or, or shifted that a so bit. So there's, there's a couple things at play here. And what that was, there's two things, especially with elk hunting, because it took me five years and seven elk hunts. So this is primarily what you're referring to is when I would come home from elk hunting every September um, and other hunts as well, but it was more poignant with this. And I just kept failing at it and I don't fail well. Like I, I get super pissed off. Um, but the other part is, and I don't know, the only way I've ever been ever to explain this is I feel more myself when I'm out in the mountains than when I'm doing anything else. Every other thing that I do, I feel like I'm supposed to be figuring out how to do it, whether it's business, social situations, even being a father is not something that like comes naturally. Like I have to think about it cognitively and like make decisions and execute behaviors. Um, and when I'm in the mountains, none of that shit happens. Like everything is on autopilot. Like I just feel this is where I'm supposed to be and this is who I am and this is where I belong. You're also alone. It's very jarring to come back. Very jarring. Um, and so when I came back, I would be really disappointed with myself that I hadn't been able to construct my life in a way where I, that was what I was supposed to be doing every day. I, and I realized that's kind of unrealistic and there's not a lot of people that do that every day, but I kind of found out that was my calling kind of too late in life to make it, you know what I mean? Like I couldn't go be a guide at 40 when I had a daughter and a mortgage and all the rest of it. Like if I'd found this stuff out when I was in my early twenties, I could have created a life where I basically lived in the mountains full time. And so that used to take a long, and it's funny, none of those feelings have changed. I'm still just as pissed when I fail and I'm still just as like despondent or I still miss the mountains just as much when I get home. But there's two things that have changed. One, I've recognized it's really selfish for me to come home from just having one to two weeks all to myself to pursue whatever I wanted and then come home and be in a shitty mood. So no matter how I feel, I can't behave like that because it's inappropriate and it's childish. And number two, and we can get into this later, but I feel like with where I'm taking Mindful Hunter and with how my life is developing with business and other things, I can see a distant, not too distant future when I like even already by most people's standards, I spend a ridiculous time hunting every year. And then if you add up when I'm doing podcasts and gear reviews and like I, a large percentage of my life does revolve around hunting already. And I do see five, 10 years down the road being able to have, you know, it even be like a financially self-sufficient thing. Also with Mindful Hunter, you have something back home in the city to do with this passion or yeah. this uh, obsession with hunting. So you you've essentially when you go away on these trips you you've generated content and i think part there's part some excitement of coming back and and doing something with all of that so that's right? the third piece that i totally forgot about and what we should also mention is that for i really only picked mindful hunter back up hardcore in like 2019 yeah and so for the four year period in the middle i was doing tons of hunting but i wasn't doing any content generation around it and you're 100 percent right even when I'm driving home, the fact that I have the video to edit is like this like soother almost or a pacifier. It's like, okay, I'm not hunting anymore, but I do get to wake up every morning at five o'clock in the morning for the next week and a half and edit this video. And then Rel I'm gonna get relive it. it. Yeah. yeah. And then I'm going to get to put the video out and I'm going to yeah. get feedback on the video and I'm going to get to like yeah. engage with the audience again. Can we mention that I, I, uh, I inspired you to get back into mindful uh, yeah yeah absolutely it was on that drive home from christmas right so what happened we were driving home from a christmas away at a cabin that would we have been 2019 rented and we were talking about was it 18 i mean esme was around right she was three maybe two or three yeah it would have been 19 because we went up anyways um 
it was close to New Year's, so we were like, oh, we should make some New Year's goals or it affirmations. Because this winter will be three years from then. Okay. So it's 2018. And uh, I'm a content creator, yeah. I guess. Uh, I own a magazine. So I'm constant. That's my job. I create content on a daily basis. Um, I'm not an influencer, but I know how to how to do that. Um, I know how to do that stuff, I yeah. guess. And uh, one of the goals you had was to pick this up again and, and pursue it in a more serious way. And I said, just post every day, one yeah. post a day. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if you think it's stupid. It's just about starting to generate this content and building a following and uh, building engagement with people and connecting with other people in, in this hunting community. And you did. You stuck to it every single day. Yeah. Um, and Mindful Hunter has blown up since then. Yeah, I've still, you know, I still, I think I have a very long way to go to get to where I see it, but definitely for, for, for most relative kind of comparisons, it, 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 it does very well for compared to where it used to be. Um, I think the other revelation was that when I first started doing Mindful Hunter, this was back in 17 or 16, I was too focused on the outcome. And it didn't get the attraction that I wanted it to get or the attention that I wanted it to get. And so everything I did, I would evaluate. Did I get enough likes? Did I get enough this? Did I get enough shares? And I remember making a deal with myself on that drive home when we filled out that sheet that I'm just going to do what I want to do. I don't care who likes it. I don't care who watches it. I'm going to make posts about things that are interesting to me. And I'm going to make videos the way I want to make the videos. If people like it, great. If not... At least then I was creating a situation where I would just keep doing it because it was something that I wanted to do. And it wasn't contingent upon my motivation wasn't contingent upon other people approving or giving me validation for what I had done. And I think that's been a big secret. Um, to success. Yeah. And take the whole Journal of Mountain Hunting uh, experiment. I did one episode. And like a couple people were not my people and they didn't like me and they complained. And it's like, and I had to tell them and that's like, well, that's why I've done Mindful Hunter the way I've done it. I'm like, as me as I can possibly be. And if you don't like me, then you don't follow me. And if you don't like the way I think about things, then you don't like my content. So it's great because I have this audience of people who are like me. So I don't have to pretend to be like anybody else. And I don't have to think about what would make a good post or how should I edit this video? I just do what... I think is cool. And then the people that tend to gravitate towards that are the people who turn into my audience. And so it gets rid of this whole like fabricated layer of bullshit and you just get to make what you want to make. And this uh, ties back in very nicely to what this whole conversation is about. How do I um, reconcile my own personal morals with, with the things that you do when they seem to be in such obvious contrast with each other? Yes. Um, I like the way you think. I like you. I like you being yourself. And I think I've always known, probably from mistakes I've made in relationships in the past, and probably also just being older when we met, right. and, and also wanting to be me and do the things that I want to do, um, that I have to let you do that. See, that's a key thing at part of our relations that I think people who get to know us, it totally confuses them. Because we are extremely different people. Except that we're both introverts. Yep, that's true. Which helps. But like there's a there's some things that we do together, but there's a whole bunch of stuff we don't. And we kind of don't want each other to do those things with each other. And I think a big secret to our success has been like go do whatever it is that is going to make you like a happy, fulfilled, productive human being. Because then when you do come back, that's the person that I want to be around. And I don't want us to have to pretend to like things that we don't or. We're also very independent introverts. Yes. We like doing things on our own. Yeah. And that sure. really means not doing everything together. Yeah. So it helps that we have different hobbies. You don't come with me to yoga. 
very much. Not anymore. Um, you should. Come. I would like to, that's one thing that we did do together that I did enjoy doing. And I would like to get, it's just not at 250 pounds. <laughs> um, and I don't go hunting with you and it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we kind of have a variety of, of things I want to talk about here just to close out. And I think we already touched on this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So somebody asked a kind of double barrel question. Has the perception of hunting changed in the last decade? And if so, has meat hunting played a role in this? What are your thoughts? I think the answer is yes. I think it still has a ways to go. But I have learned things from you that I didn't know 10, 20 years ago. Um, I think certainly people, there's tons of films, documentaries, books about the meat industry, the processed meat industry that are exposing how terrible it really is, um, how cruel it is, how bad for the environment it is, how bad for our health it is. And um, I've definitely learned that um, maybe hunting is an alternative to that, a good alternative to that. I'm not sure I used to know that. Right. In fact, I probably didn't know that. Um, but you've definitely exposed that to me. Um, so, yeah. I think the inverse is true as well. Being married to a vegetarian, and it was funny because I did that big project for one campfire around shifting the sentiment of hunters in the non-hunting outdoor enthusiast kind of demographic. And it was a very easy project for me to get because I've lived with a vegetarian for the last decade. And it has helped me understand and be sensitive to the types of, and I, I'm going to use the term arguments loosely, but the type of arguments that actually land. Because I think I used to think I understood why you would be opposed to something, but I didn't really. And it wasn't until we had a bunch of these conversations um, that I started to understand, like, because your opinions and feelings around hunting are just as valid as my opinions and feelings around hunting and you not wanting to do it is just okay as me wanting to do it. But I used to think some arguments would land and then they don't, like they just didn't make any difference at all. And then other, other arguments did land. Like I think the whole, it, it's a pretty natural way to go out when you think about it, you know, like, an animal can grow up on the farm, live in this little cage, kind of have a shitty existence and then get smashed in the head with a bolt in some abattoir. Or this deer can like, for all intents and purposes, like have a pretty good life. Frolic in the forest. And then just one day, yeah. bam, gets smoked in the back of the head and it's painless. And it's and not, that's not how it always happens. But something like that is probably not something I would have typically brought up with a vegetarian because you think it's, you're talking about the death and it's grotesque, but you're, it was more about the compassion and the kind of life that the animal had than it was about kind of the way it went out. And there's other examples of things like that. Now, the caveat here is I will never go with you. No. I never want to be there at that moment where you make the decision to pull the trigger or shoot an arrow into an animal. Yeah. Um, I don't want to witness or experience that in my life, but I don't need to. No. No, and I think that's fine. Yeah. And my only issue is with people who eat meat who have that. There's lots of people who eat meat and condemn hunting. And I'm like, that's the part that blows my mind in half because it's just very hypocritical. But you don't eat meat. So I think it's perfectly acceptable that it's not something that you should. You're not obligated to participate in in that way. Well, obviously, there's work to be done. But I do think going back to what we first said about the hippies and stuff, I think there's as far as this individual's question about the perception of hunting has definitely changed over the last decade. My opinion, it's almost gone a little bit too far, but I'm not going to get into that right now because it's a bit of a digression. But anyways, up next, and I feel like we've already answered this one, but you can expand on it if you want. How can a vegetarian be married to a hunter? We fell in love and we got married. Yeah. And I think you even said, you just then it's like, I like you. I like the way you think about things. This is something that you do. 
so I can accept that it's an activity. It's who you and, are. Yeah. It really is who you are. I 100% know that. It's not just a passing fancy. Which is funny because I've had a lot of those. And that's that was the other thing, I think, why we didn't have to... Because if it wasn't CrossFit, then it was jujitsu or it was whatever. Like there was like I run in like three year cycles and things fascinate me for three years and then I move on and I don't have anything to do with them. And that's kind of what I've done my whole life with a whole bunch of different things. And I think that was the other thing that you thought when I first got into hunting is that this is just going to be a passing fancy like everything else. I think this was the culmination of everything else. Like all that other stuff had little bits that satisfied me in some way but it kept failing like it didn't get me the whole way there whereas hunting is like the perfect culmination of all of it let's Especially, also be honest you needed to get to a place of stability for yeah. all this to happen i think marriage yes was a place of financial and emotional stability where you were able to focus in on what you really were passionate about yeah and have the support because you do need, yeah, yeah, you do need, you either have to live a very solitary lifestyle or you have to have somebody who supports you in your passions in, in order to, to do it um, because you can't do those things by yourself. So I think we've answered that question. Yeah. So the, the, the initial question that somebody asked was, how do you manage cooking two different diets? And I amended it because there's actually three. So there's me, you, and Esme. And all three of us normally eat something at least marginally different every single night. Yeah. And so how do we do that? We're not fancy eaters. Not during the week. Like we, we do in spurts, but like on a Monday to Friday, like regular routine, not at all. Yeah. We're not like rolling out pasta dough and no. putting together elaborate three course meals for ourselves so that it's easy we're, we're cooking easy stuff yeah i like side dishes yes i eat a lot of i think a lot of vegetarians would say that they you you know for a long time we would go to restaurants they didn't have vegetarian options in the 80s and 90s really unless you went to a hippie vegetarian restaurant like the nom in vancouver yeah. and so you would order off the side dish menu and that's how i've grown up eating and i continue to eat that way so you know, if you will make, you'll make your ground meat and we'll have potatoes on the side and I'll eat the potatoes and whatever else there is that's veggie. Or last night, two nights ago, we had corn on the cob and, and meat and I'll eat the corn on the cob. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a pretty basic eater, so I don't think it's hard. I think if you're trying to, like my mom would make more elaborate dinners and we'd all sit down and eat them and it was harder for her because yeah. there was a main dish that was really the bulk of the meal that if it had meat in it, I couldn't eat. And she would have to prepare something separate. That'd be like a casserole or something with meat in it. We don't do that, right? Yeah, I think that I think the key is they're like little building blocks and there'll always be a little overlap between all three. Like me and Mimi will have one or two things the same. Me and you will have one or two things the same. And you and Mimi might have one or two things yeah. the same. So we're only cooking like three or four things. And each person just has two or three of those things. Like we might make mac and cheese just for Esme. And I'm going to have leftover rice. But then the chicken that I barbecue, both Mimi are going to eat. And then you could have my rice with some peas. And yeah. so we've made four or five things and it's not super complicated. Also, we do a ton of leftovers. And because of the whole bodybuilding thing I'm into, I normally have Tupperware dishes full of shit in the fridge and a pot of rice pre-cooked that just sits out on a yeah. stove, except in the summertime because yeah. it gets disgusting. I, I've just been eating kind of the same my whole life. Yeah. And so nothing really has changed and nothing, nothing seems complicated. I think it surprises most people that I do most of the cooking. You do. I'm not a good cook. No. I burn, You're a good baker. I'm good at baking. I, I'm a horrible burn everything cook. Else. Burn pasta. You turn everything on high. <laughs> like it's like they're just, they're just like on and off with a burner for you. Yeah. There's no gray area in the middle. So what are we having for dinner tonight? Well, there's still leftover ground bear. Um, we need a carb actually. Whether Let's do we, pasta. 
Yeah, we could do See, that. See, so for stuff. example, we'll do a pot of spaghetti. Yeah. Mimi will have that with um, nothing. Butter and some grated part like powder cheese, right? Yeah. I'll have it with the tomato sauce and cheese. Yeah. Um, and you'll have it with tomato, tomato sauce, sauce and, and ground milk. That's beer. a perfect example. Yeah. And of, then of how we do it is kind of satisfying. Yeah. And we don't. Again, I think if you're if you're talking about like elaborate yeah. meals. I can imagine that being maybe more complicated, but that's not how we eat. So no, and it also I, doesn't I take us long. Like we spend maybe fifteen minutes, yeah. twenty minutes cooking. Like well, it's perfect not example. We tried to do those meal kits, right? Yeah, yeah. And they were horrible for us. They, they were delicious, but it was like it took so long. Took so long to then, make it. It didn't offer that flexibility that we were just talking no. about. There, they were meals that were re you know required to make everything together, like in one pot, as if that's easier. Yeah. And I imagine it's easier for some people, but for us. That's and our not kid doesn't easier. like stuff like that. She won't eat things that well, have three eats, or four ingredients. She, she eats likes, things on a plate with three compartments yeah. so that they don't touch. And she likes that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty much. Um, oh, how do you feel about mounts in the house? And has that changed over time? I was thinking about this question. They've never been in the parts of the house that I reside Ooh, in. That's true too. We've always in Langley, they were in the basement. Did I even have any in Langley? A, cu a couple, I think. There okay. were skulls, like, on your yeah. desk. Um, in On Napier Street, they were in your office upstairs. I never went there. Yeah. Um, and here we have a whole basement suite that you're going to... Live in. Live in. <laughs> with your dead animals. Yeah. I, it's It's kind of like ignorance is bliss. I don't like them that much. They don't... For me, they're not pretty... I also don't do, so I do bear rugs, but 90% of my mounts aren't technically what people would call mounts. They're, they're not euros. real. They don't look like real No, animals. they're not stuffed animals. They're yeah. just a white skull with antlers attached to it. And I think that's a lot easier to digest. Plus it's kind of artsy these days. Like you go to some places and they've got like, you know, shed antlers, chandeliers, it's and this, like, uh, it's a bit of a look. Desert chic. Yeah. I, it's not my aesthetic. They're yeah. not going to be on the main floor. No. So that's fine. Okay. Again, it's it's your thing. It's in your office. I don't mind. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not like, I won't enter if there are animals. It's not like that. Um, they're not part of our kind of shared living space, really. Right. Yeah. They never have been. That would be kind of weird to have a whole house full of it. And I lived it. That would, I think that would be weird. Yeah. And it's fine with me because I like having them around. And it's not like I have so many of them that I can't fit them in a couple rooms in the basement. Does that mean you're stopping? No. I will. We'll figure something out. Maybe I'll keep some in storage and I'll rotate them out. I think, too, it's like some of my animals, they mean a lot because they were first ones, but they're not like super impressive animals. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They, they have sentimental value, but they're not impressive trophy class. Little guys. Yeah. And, and I think as things go on and I start and I become better at what I do and I do, I have started harvesting like older, more mature animals that are a little bit more impressive to have on the wall. The little guys can just get tucked away. Are you planning on like a bear, like a taxidermied bear? Like a full bear? You wouldn't fit. I don't want that. There's part See, but I always say that. I always say I don't want like the next level. Yeah. And then we you go we, to the we, next we level the and next then level. I I feel like I I'm okay with it or I have to be I resign myself to it and it's yeah. fine. So that's interesting because that was the final one of the next questions and probably the final question. I just wrote specific animals cuz for you for the longest time I didn't it was want bears. a bear. You just said, just promise me you're not going to hunt bears. And it's bears. still like that. You've gotten black bears. I don't want you to get a grizzly bear ever. Right. In my mind, like that's, that's the next the level that I don't, I don't want that to happen. Yeah. But it will happen probably. And I guess I'll be okay with it. I wish this was like more controversial. I feel like, would it be make for better listening? You know, if I was like super angry about this or if we were on the brink of divorce because of it. Why I not? think this is what people are supposed to take away from this. Like... I don't care if it's a vegetarian and a hunter or a Republican and a Democrat right. or a conservative and a liberal or a fucking whatever and a whatever. These are elements of who you are. They are not 
who you are. And I don't think anybody should be like diametrically opposed to anybody else's philosophy. Who was I listening to? Oh, it was a podcast with Andy Stumpf the other day. And somebody got mad at him because he doesn't argue enough with his guests. And he's like, listen, man, I'm willing to listen to anyone, no matter what their opinion is on anything. Could be a member of the KKK. I don't have to agree with you. I don't have to embrace what you believe, but I'm going to respect you as a human being. And I'm going to give you a chance to kind of express yourself about why you feel the way you feel. Um, we're not into the KKK. We're not into the KKK. That was a very severe example. But like, that's another, I suppose when it comes to like basic human rights, this is probably, th these are probably bad examples because there's really no, you know, situation in which those should be like acceptable philosophies to have. But like. There's a benefit in hearing someone out though. Yes. You can't form an opinion against someone until you hear them out. Yeah. It's ludicrous. Yeah. Then you're just spouting off about things you don't know about and you're just as ignorant. Better to have all the facts, right? And then you can say something or form, form an opinion or live your life accordingly, right? 100%. So in closing... Which is what we've done. I've learned about this. I continue to live my life accordingly. Yeah. I will never eat meat again, I don't think. No. I thought maybe when I was pregnant, I, they were, you know, people told me, you'll probably get cravings for protein. Never right. did. Got cravings for a Coca-Cola classic. That's about it. I don't anticipate this changing for me, but I don't anticipate it changing for you either. We can, no. we can choose to live together because of all the other things that work. Um, and acceptance, right? See, and that's, that's one point that I don't, I think we touched on indirectly. I think people are under the misbegotten notion that you have to be like a hundred percent in tune with Aligned. somebody else. Yeah. Right. And it's like, yeah, there's like 80% of you that is perfect for me. The other 20% I don't, is not really my cup of tea. Like there's things you care about and there's things you think that I don't agree with. And I don't tend to care my, there's, I don't care to spend my time thinking about, but like you just accept that. It's like, yeah. okay, that's just part of who she is and what she does. And we don't need to be in agreement on everything. No, I don't think this would work for everyone. I think if you want to do things together all the time, that's part, and, and that's part of yeah. your personality, this wouldn't work. Um, we are two, we are people who both similarly don't want to be together all the time, doing stuff together all the time. I don't even want to be doing things with our daughter all the time. Yeah. You know, like I, I, I need to be alone. Um, so, so that works for us. That's our dynamic, you know, and maybe, maybe we appreciate that too. I, Thank yes. goodness we met someone that lets us be alone. Be by ourselves. Yeah. Yes. A hundred percent. Like this right now is exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I think you've kind of already answered, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So in closing, what would you say? And mostly like vegetarians are not going to be listening to my podcast, but like there's hunters out there and there's, there's two kind of voices you can speak to them in. One is like a vegetarian. So they have, they have people in their life who matter to them, who don't understand what it, why hunting is important to them. What are some things that you would say to them? And then two to the dudes who are married, who have problems taking time away. Like any words of advice for those two like situations? Again, I just finished saying this works for us. I don't know if it works for everybody. I think there are, I don't want to say codependent relationships because that has negative con connotations, but I definitely have couple friends who enjoy being together more than we do. Yeah. Um, and in those cases, I don't know. I think there will be friction. Right, right. Um, with the time away, amount of time away. I mean, you So it's like not always something that can be negotiated. It might be a matter of if this is something you want to do, you got to find somebody who's going to be okay with that. Probably. Yeah. Isn't that true of most things? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be hunting. What if, what if you enjoy going off and uh, think 
what if like amusement parks are your thing and like you like going for two weeks at a time and, and you're married to someone who hates roller coasters and would rather not go and wants to spend all their time with you anyway, you might have a problem if you're not willing to give that up, right? Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I think we're in a, our own unique situation as everyone is where it works. Do you think it'll work forever? I do because I think we also compromise because like, I want to go be a guide, right? Because I just want to be in the You want to own, you want to own like an a... An outfit, yes. And we've even said that there would be a compromise there, right? Yeah. I'm into it if there's a pool. <laughs> yeah, most of them don't <laughs> have pools. <clears throat> well, we'd have a special one. But I think I've realized there's a limit like to what you're willing to accept. And I think it's a reasonable limit. Like if it was, if it was unreasonable or if it wasn't far enough that I felt like I was still meaningfully engaging in my passion and the way I wanted to do it, that would be, that would be different. Our life is, lives are only getting easier. Like the last five years between when, like five and a half years ago from now, our daughter wasn't born. I had just started a full-time MBA and was still working full-time for somebody else and you were working for somebody else. Within that five and a half years, we've bought and sold three different homes. We've both quit our full-time jobs and run our own successful businesses. Our daughter is getting older. We're more financially stable, stable than we've ever been. Um, and so life is only getting better. So I think if you just keep going along that time horizon, you only get to spend more time doing whatever it is that you want to do. You know what I mean? As long as you're respecting what your partner needs. Mm -hmm. Like there's things that you need from me in order to feel supported and cared for as a wife. And as long as I do those things, for the most part, I can kind of do whatever I want as long as my obligations are met. So yeah, I don't see why things, why things would change. But it comes from a conscious decision on my part that it like, I got to realize how far I can, like, I'm not going to get to hunt in September. This is a prime example. September is elk season. It's the rut. It's my favorite month of the year, but I wanted to do a sheep hunt this year and I will get to do a fall hunt, but we know that me asking to go away in August for two weeks and then right away, go away in September again, because I did that one year, that does not work. Mm -hmm. That's too much for you. It's too difficult. And so there's a perfect example. Yeah, I would love to go chase elk in the rut in September, but I need to recognize that there's a limit to what I can ask. And so I'll maybe go on a mule deer hunt in late October, and that'll put two and a half months between my sheep hunt and a, and a deer hunt, and that will be a much more palatable proposition for you. Yeah. It's also important for me to see you working yeah. in between. <laughs> I, you know, otherwise it would appear as though you don't work that much. Yes, um, when I do. But obviously your work is, is, is very, uh, very important to our family and, yes. and supporting us, as is mine. So, um, you know, just that we're both contributing there and and that I can see that is important. Yeah. You're not off on vacation all the time, right? No. So. No. Okay, let's wrap it up. We both have shit to do. So as always, I'd like to thank everybody. And if you can engage with the podcast in any way, shape or form, likes, comments, subscribes on whatever platform you choose to engage with the material on, I would greatly appreciate it. And other than that, thanks for tuning in.